Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. Today is going to be episode number three in our IFR tutorial series and that means we're going to be going over approach plates and how to read them. So if you want to know more about how to read an approach plate then I think you should stay tuned right here on 2020 Flight Simmers. To boldly go where no one has gone before. Okay, so we're going to dive right into this, but before we do, I just want to preface this by saying that this tutorial is solely based on flight simulation. So anything that really doesn't pertain to that, we're going to just leave out of the video. Now, if you are new to the channel, don't forget to go down below and hit that subscribe button and tick that little bell. If the video does help you out today, smash on that thumbs up button. It is greatly appreciated. Let's start off by taking a look at the right hand top of the approach plate. Now this is called the margin identifier and this is going to list the procedure and in this case we're looking at the ILS or localizer to runway 16 right as well as the ICAO which will be right underneath of that. Now if we slide over here to the left we got some procedure information and this is going to start by giving us the localizer slash DME frequency as well as a channel number underneath of that. Now that's really important because that lets us know that the localizer also gives us the DME. Now if you did not have a channel number underneath of your localizer frequency, that means that there is no DME on that localizer and look for another VOR on the runway or close by that you're gonna be getting your DME from. Now if you don't know what DME stands for, that is your distance measuring equipment. Now, if we look next to that, we have the approach course of 173 degrees. And next to that, we have the runway landing length, as well as the touchdown zone elevation and the airport elevation. Now, keep in mind that the airport elevation and the touchdown zone elevation can be different. Underneath of the procedure info, we get into the briefing strip. Now, we're going to start over here to the left by giving us any notes that we may need for the procedure. Now, if we take a look here, it says for inoperative Mauser lighting, increase the localizer cat D visibility to an RVR of 4,500. So these are gonna be some important notes to brief yourself on before you do the approach. Now, next to that is going to give us the type of lighting that we can expect to see at this runway. And that is the Mauser lighting as well as it gives us a nice little depiction of what the lights are gonna look like when we approach the runway. To the right of that, it has our missed approach in a textural format. Now below this information, we're gonna have all of the frequencies that we're gonna be using for the approach into Denver. Now the first frequency that we're gonna to wanna to tune into would be your ATIS frequency, and that starts over here on the left. We have your arrivals on top, your departures on the bottom. Next to that is the approach frequencies. Depending on which way you're coming from, either north or south, will depend on which approach controller you're going to be contacting. To the right of that gives us the tower for Denver International. And then we have the ground and clearance frequencies to the right of that. Now below the briefing strip, we're going to get into what's called the plan view. Now on the plan view, if we take a look over here to the left, this is gonna give all of our initial approach fixes all the way down to the final approach fix. So now depending on what star you're using, depending on the direction you're coming, that is all going to play a part in which initial approach fix you're gonna be using. But for today's tutorial, we're gonna make believe we're coming in on the Kipper initial approach fix. So now one of the first things that we're gonna take notice of underneath of the Kipper identifier, you're gonna see 12,000 with a line above and below that. Now that's gonna let us know that that is a hard flight level. It means you can't go above that or below that. When you hit Kipper, you've gotta be at 12,000 feet. I don't wanna hear commentary, argument, or opinion. To the right of that is gonna be 210 with a K next to it, and that's gonna give us our speed. So that reads 210 knots. Again, you're also gonna see that line above and below that, and we cannot bust that speed no faster and no slower. Now, on our way to the Haley Waypoint, 
we have three other bits of information in between here. Now the first number that we're gonna see, which is 12,000, we can call that our MEA, which would be a minimum en route altitude. Underneath of that is gonna be our course heading of 249, and underneath of that, in parentheses, is gonna give you the approximate mileage between Kipper and Haley. Now, as you can see, there is no flight restriction at Haley, but we have to maintain that 12,000 foot MEA all the way to Haley. Now from Haley to SKIMJ, you can see that that MEA has dropped to 11,500 feet. And you can also see that we have a total distance here of 2.7 miles to the SKIMJ waypoint. Now, once we hit that waypoint again, we see there are no hard flight restrictions at that waypoint. So we can follow that all the way to the CU waypoint. And we can see now our MEA has dropped to 10,600 feet. Now, once we pass the CU waypoint, we have no hard flight restrictions yet, but we do have an MEA of 10,000 feet all the way down into shred. Now at the shred waypoint, we can see that we have a hard flight restriction now of 10,000 feet. We have a line above it and below it, so we cannot bust that flight restriction. The high deck for this hop was 10,000 feet. You knew it, you broke it. At the shred waypoint, we also see there's an 18.5 in kind of a hollowed out D shape. That tells us we are 18.5 miles from the localizer. Now, if we take a look over to the right, we're getting a top-down view from the shred waypoint all the way down into runway 16 right. Now, we can take note of all the different MEAs here on the left. So, we have 10,000, 8,000, 7,000, and we also have the approximate mileage between waypoints in the parentheses underneath of that MEA. Now, if we take a look at the right-hand side, it gives us similar information. Now you're also going to notice one other thing that's a little bit different here is that we also have a distance, but this time it's in kind of a hollowed out D shape. That's going to give us the distance from that waypoint to the localizer frequency that's giving us the DME information. Next, if we take a look down a little bit, we can see the localizer frequency as well as the Morse code identifier right underneath of that. And again, you can see the channel 56, and that lets us know that we are getting our DME information from the localizer. Now over here to the right, you also see the Denver VOR at 117.9, and that also has a Morse code identifier as well as DME associated with that VOR. To the right and the left-hand side, we see an alternate missed approach fix as well as the missed approach fix. We take a look at the missed approach fix we can see here that it's giving us a 116.3 so that's going to be the vor that you're going to tune to as well as the radial out of the vor so the reason they're giving us this information is so that we can also help identify when we're going to be hitting the bruise waypoint so underneath of bruise you can see bruise to fqf is 26 in the hollowed out d here that tells us that from bruise to FQF is 26 miles. So once you pass the FQF Vortac, you can now monitor your DME so that once you're 26 miles out on that radio of 254, that lets you know you're right around the bruise waypoint. Now, if we take a look over here at the top right, we're gonna see something that says MSA Denver 25 nautical miles. Now the MSA is your minimum safe altitude in the area around the Denver Vortac. The minimum safe altitude here in the box is 9,200 feet. So that means that anywhere within 25 nautical miles of the Denver VOR, 9,200 feet is your minimum safe altitude to fly. So now we're going to take a look at the bottom of the approach plate. Over on the right, we have a top down view of the airport diagram. Now on the top left of the diagram, we have the airport elevation as well as the touchdown zone elevation for runway 16 right. 
Now there's a couple things we can take notice of looking at this airport diagram. And one is you can see the beacon and that has a star showing us exactly where the beacon is for the airport. So now right underneath of the beacon, we can see it has TWR and that's gonna give the tower height. So at 5,704 feet is what you would read on your altimeter. Each side of the runways, we can see an A5 that's going to let us know that we're using the Mauser lighting, as well as the little dot above that. That lets us know that there's a beacon, a flashing beacon there as well. Below the A5, you're going to see a little P in a circle. That's going to let us know that there are Pappy lights on the runway, and they're going to be located on the right-hand side of the runway. If we take a look at the bottom here, we can see it says HIRL all runways. That pretty much tells us what lighting is on all the different runways. Now we're gonna take a look at another ILS approach plate. And if we look here, it has a little L next to that. Now what that's gonna tell us is that the runway lighting is pilot activated. On an approach plate like this, at the top where we have our tower frequency, we also have that little L there. That lets us know that the frequency that is in here of 118.525 is also the frequency that we need to key up to activate the lighting on the runways. So if you ever see that and it's darkened in, that means that that is pilot activated lighting. But on this particular airport, the Pappy lights are always lit because they're depicted here with a hollowed out symbol. Okay, so let's go back to Denver. So now if we look below the runway lighting, we have another chart here. And this is so if you're going to calculate your distance based on your speed that you're traveling. So if you were going 60 knots in five minutes and six seconds, you will have gone 5.1 nautical miles. So that's just another way to kind of keep track as to where you are on the approach. Okay, so now if we look to the left of the airport diagram, we can take a look at the profile view of the approach, as well as our minimums that are below that. Now it's gonna give us pretty much most of the same information that we saw from the top-down view above, but just in a side profile view. So we can see all the different step-downs along the way, but you're also gonna see from the Newland down to the Jetson waypoint is that we now have an altitude with a line underneath of it. Now that lets us know that we can be higher than that altitude, but we cannot be lower than that particular altitude. Now, once we get to the Maltese Cross and the Jetson Waypoint, we're now gonna be about 4.9 nautical miles from the localizer frequency. And that is also gonna be our final approach fix. That's around the time where you can expect to pick up your glide slope on the way down into the runway. Now, if we look to the top left of the profile view, we're going to see also a top-down view for the missed approach fix. It's gonna give us all the same information just in a pictorial view instead of a textural view as you saw at the top right. All right, so now let's take a look at the minimum section below the profile view. Now, the first thing you'll see here at the top above the minimums is a category section. We have category A, B, C, D, and there's one more category, but that's mainly used for military aircraft. That is going to do is categorize your aircraft based upon speed, but not just any speed, it's gonna be your VREF speed. Now, if you're unsure of the VREF speed for the aircraft, all you have to do is take 1.3 and multiply that by the stall speed. So now each of these categories go as followed. Category A is under 91 knots. Category B is from 91 to 120 knots. Category C is from 121 knots to 140 knots. And category D is from 141 knots to 165 knots. Here's a little caveat to this. If you are in a little Cessna and you are normally rated at a category A and you decide you're gonna kick it, and go 95 knots in on your approach, well, that automatically now puts you into the category B status. But it does not work the same way in reverse. If you're a King Air and you're a category B aircraft and you decide, well, 
hey, I'm just going to uh, putt all the way in at 85 knots, that does not put you in a category A airplane for the approach. So keep that in mind here. Okay, so next we're gonna take a look at the different types of approach minimums. And the first one here is an ILS approach. This is gonna be classified as a precision approach. Underneath of that is our localizer approach. That's gonna be a non-precision approach. If we look to the right of the ILS 16R, you're gonna see 5526 followed by an 18 with a forward slash before it. And next to that, we're gonna have a 200. The 5526 is gonna be our decision altitude. Next to that, because we have a forward slash, that tells us that the figure following that is gonna be an RVR value as well as it's going to be in hundreds of feet. Now we've talked about this before and pretty much anything aeronautical, if you put two zeros next to it, you'll probably have the right figure. So if we add two zeros to that one eight, we get 1800 feet. So now let's go through this. Once you hit 5,526 feet of being your decision altitude, you must have 1800 feet runway visual range to continue on the approach. If you do not have that, then you must execute your missed approach. The 200 figure that is next to that is a decision height. Now that would also be classified as a AGL level. Now below that, we're gonna talk about the localizer approach minimums. The first number we see here is 5,640 followed by a forward slash and a 24. We also have 314 next to that. Now the 5,640 is now going to be the minimum descent altitude. That means that we cannot descend lower than that altitude if we do not meet the RVR minimum of 2,400 feet. Next to that is the 314, and that's gonna be the HAT, which is, stands for Height Above Touchdown. Next, we're gonna take a look at another ILS chart that has some different figures here at the bottom. Now, this is for Easton, Maryland, and we're gonna be taking a look at the ILS Runway 4, as well as the Localizer 4, and the Circling Approach. So the ILS is gonna be your precision approach, and the localizer and the circling approach are gonna be both non-precision approaches. So now let's take a look at the ILS runway four. Now we see here that we have 273 followed by a dashed line and three quarters. That's a little bit different because that is not a RVR value. That is now a statute miles of visibility value. So at 273 for our decision altitude, we need to make sure that we have three quarter of a mile visual before we can proceed on the approach. Next to that, we also have the decision height, which is the AGL level, and some figures and parentheses that the military uses. Underneath of that, let's take a look at the localizer approach. So you can see that they've broken this down from categories A and B and C and D. Now, in this instance, they're the same figures, but you can see how it could be different based upon your aircraft speed. On the non-precision localizer approach, we have our MDA, which is our minimum descent altitude of 540 feet, but now we need to have one statute mile of visibility. Next to that is our hat, which is 482 feet, height above touchdown. Now, if we take a look below at the circling approach, which is another non-precision approach, we have different values now for pretty much every category of plane. All right, so I think that's gonna about wrap us up for today. If anybody has any questions, please post those down below in the comments section, and I will get back to you as soon as I can. I wanna thank everybody for joining us. If you haven't done so already, please go down there and hit that subscribe and tick that little bell. You don't wanna miss out on any future videos just like this one. And to all my flight simmer friends around the world, keep the blue side up. We will see you on the next one. Now, if you haven't seen our other previous two episodes, click over here to the right. Thanks for watching, everybody.